All right, Matthew, we're looking at lesson number seven. We're going to talk about the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Uh, remember, the temptation of Jesus was not given to cause him to fail in any way whatsoever. Jesus, God cannot fail. Uh, he knew no sin. Uh, Titus 1 2, it's not going to have verse separate, but Titus 1 2 says, God who cannot lie. So, you know, we're conditioned to say that God can do anything. Uh, but the reality of it is there's some things God can't do. He can't sin. Right? He can't lie. It's not in his nature to do that. Uh, it's not a matter that he just won't lie. The Bible says he cannot lie. Uh, maybe, there's another verse that says that as well. It seems like it might be in Second Peter. But uh, nevertheless, he knew no sin. He did no sin. He had no sin. He took upon the flesh, but he did not take upon himself the sin nature. And so the temptation was a very real temptation because temptation is given to prove he could pass the test. Just like in our lives, when God puts us through a test, it's to show that we can pass the test. Now, if we fail it, it's not God's fault it's because we took our eyes off of him. So whatever God has given to us, it may seem hard to handle, and if it gets to the point where you can't handle it, that's because you're not where God wants you to be. Right? He wants you to be closer to Him. Any trial we go through is designed for uh, several different things. Sometimes God may have you suffer for your own benefit. Uh, God could have you suffer for your sin. Right? That, that is a possibility. Uh, and then there's other times when God has you suffer that has nothing to do with you alone, but it's for other people. Uh, Second Corinthians talks about that, that uh, uh, with the comfort that you're given, God says uh, things that you've gone through, and read it exactly. It's, uh, Verse 3, Titus, uh, excuse me, uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 3, 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, there it is. Uh, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds in others. And whether we be afflicted, he said, it is for your consolation and salvation, and the, which is effectual and enduring. So Paul's saying here, you know, if I suffer, my suffering may be for your comfort and for your deliverance. Right? So you can see Jesus Christ in Paul. So God may put you through a test that doesn't benefit you personally, but it benefits those around you. And so then, again, sometimes he puts you a test to benefit you. And sometimes he puts, may put you through uh, uh, chastening because of sin. And that's where, you know, if you're going through a tough time, I can never assume it's because of sin. I, and I should never assume that. Uh, I assume that God is using you for whatever reason. Now, if I'm going through a, a tough time, the first thing I'm going to do, though, about myself is to consider whether it's sin or not. Right? Now, I won't do that about you because I can't judge that, but you can. But for myself, I judge, okay, is this sin if, if, if because I did wrong, Lord? Am I being chastened? If I am, let me learn a lesson. If that's not the answer, then I pray, okay, Lord, uh, how does this benefit me? And if I pray for a bread and still can't understand it, then I go to the fact is, okay, Lord, uh, use this to benefit others. Right? And so, in your own personal life, you judge whether it's sin or not. Nobody else can do that. But in your, your life, you, you judge that first. But for Jesus, he could not sin. Right? And so the test was to show us, it, it wasn't for his benefit, but to show us how to pass the test. How, what he used every time? Scripture. And so, we, we use Scripture a lot. So, it was given to prove that he would, would not fail. And very importantly, to provide us with an example. So we see that 
uh, um, again, he went to Deuteronomy. Uh, he used scripture every time. Uh, we knew he wasn't going to fail the test. And now we have this great example. So anytime, in any way, whatsoever you're in trouble, first thing to do is go to the scriptures and judge yourselves by the scriptures. If it's sin, repent. If it's not, then the Lord wanted me to learn from this. And the very fact is, we're all living in dying bodies. Right? So every ache and pain that you have is not due to personal sin or chasing of God or even testing by God. You're living in a dying body. If you can blame anybody, blame Adam and Eve. But really, you can't even do that. Okay? Because if they didn't mess up, we probably would have. So it doesn't make any difference who messed up first. Uh, but we're all going to have aches and pains and as the years go on. You, know, you used to watch people walk them down steps and think, man, why is that so hard? And then I watch people get up out of chair and they go, oh, I guess they won't live it. Yeah. And I think, okay, I start getting now, but my problem is, when I sit down, I groan. I mean, you think that would be the easiest of all things to do. So, yeah. The fact is, we're, we're, we're all living in dying bodies. We're going to have problems. Matthew 5 is a Sermon on the Mount. What we call calls the Beatitudes. Beatitudes. Not beauty tunes. I heard somebody say that. We don't the beauty tunes. It's not the Beatles either. <laughs> but the Beatitudes. The blessed category. The word blessed is a, it's a pretty amazing word in the Bible. Uh, generally, there are two different words in the New Testament for, for blessed. Uh, one is makarios, uh, M-A-K-A-R-I-O-S, makarios. And that means to make happy. The other... M-A-K-A-R-I-O-S. The other is eulogetos, which is E-U-G-O-G-E-T-O-S. E-U-G? L. O E U G L O G E T O S. Is that what I said? The L before it. I don't know. You don't write down the board. It's hard to do it. He left the L out. E U L G E T O S. U L O G E T O S. Okay. And that means. Dr. K, have you ever heard that blessed means happy? Have you ever heard that? Yeah, yeah Makarios means happy, okay. to make happy. Okay. Eulogy, the eulogy okay. is we get the word eulogy from it. Oh, okay. All right, what's done in a eulogy? Speak. Uh, to speak good of. Speak, speak good of, speak well of. To, to speak well of or to speak something good about a person, what have you. Most of the time, in the Bible, in the New Testament, these are New Testament Greek words, but, but the word makarios is used when it's God speaking about man. Whereas eulogetos is used when man is speaking of God. Now, I think it might be a couple of times in the New Testament where it's man speaking about other people. Uh, but it's not, it's always, Makaros is always God speaking to man. Eulogetos is normally man speaking about God. So, what does that mean for us? It means, well, when we bless God, how do we bless God? By speaking well of Him. Remember uh, Malachi 3.16. Malachi 3.16 is a great, great verse. Uh, it talks about when two people are uh, gathered together, 
and they're sitting around talking about God. Yeah, it says, And they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him to them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. So when we're blessing God, God hears it and he writes it down. Now, God doesn't have to write anything down, but why would he write it down? Well, the way I usually illustrate it is like this. Uh, did you have any pictures of Gina? Absolutely. Right. Uh, why? Did you forget what it looked like? No, but it's just... They're there to remind you. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, God's not going to forget, but there, it's like a, a picture to him, to remind him of us. Uh, and so we have a picture of, a, of people we love in our homes that will never forget what they look like, but they're there to remind us. That's a remind and that's what it's a book of remembrance. God, now, like I say, God doesn't need to be reminded. He's God. But it shows us how touching it is. That's a, it's a very... Just touch your heart. Yeah, it, it touches your heart. You think that God, God cares about what I say. I say. Well, An almighty God. The word beatitude means supreme blessedness or happiness. So beatitude has to be along with the word we carry on. The Beatitudes, content Beatitudes, are talking about uh, who will be the citizens of the kingdom and the characteristics of the people. The word kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven is a very uh, debated uh, topic in, with people in the New Testament. Uh, I've heard some say that the kingdom of God always refers to uh, uh, Christians today, and the kingdom of heaven always refers to things in heaven. The problem with the, that is, if you look them up, sometimes kingdom of heaven refers to now, sometimes kingdom of heaven refers to the millennial kingdom, and sometimes kingdom of God refers to the millennial kingdom. So, neither phrase means really anything different, it's only different by context. So, it, it, are we in the kingdom today? We're not in the millennial kingdom, but are we in the kingdom? Well, do we consider Jesus our king? Yes, we do. Has he been crowned? No, not yet. But do we consider that? Yes. Are we one of his? Yes. So, we are in the kingdom today. Uh, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, whatever you want to call it, doesn't make any difference. And so, just generally speaking, and that's what we're talking about here, the characteristics of the people of God. Right? So who are they and what should be the characteristics? How do we know another believer? Well, the characters of believers should include these qualities. Similar to what we talked about in Galatians 5.22 with the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is how we recognize one another. And fruit of the Spirit, all nine fruits of the fruit of the Spirit is one fruit of the Spirit. And so we should all be showing all nine characteristics. Well, here we have eight qualities mentioned here in the Beatitudes of how that we should act one towards another, how we should live our lives. Uh, our attitudes about ourselves, very important. Uh, poor in spirit. And that means to have a humble opinion of ourselves. I think sometimes people get the idea that the church wouldn't be anything but wasn't for them. I haven't even heard pastors sometimes say that. Well, what maybe we wouldn't have the church today? Well, uh, maybe God did use you to build the church, but remember, it was God who, who did it. Anything that we are can only be through the power of God. And anytime we get high and mighty, God can cut us down. So we should have a humble opinion. Now, you know, it doesn't mean that we don't have confidence. A humble opinion doesn't mean that you're shy and timid about everything. It just means you're, uh, what's the, uh, the prayer I one time, Lord, without you we is nothing, nothing can we do. Well, that's true. But with him, we can do all things. So we can have a confidence in God's ability to work through us, but remember, it's God's ability. We don't have any righteousness of our own. And we didn't do anything to earn salvation. By grace are we saved. Through God's mercy. Of course.
course, if you're not poor in spirit, then you'd be proud of heart. And who are the proud of heart? Well, the book of Revelation talks about the land of sins. Pharisees, very proud. They were Pharisees. So the mentality that we have does make a big difference. For since by grace are we saved through faith is a gift of God. The gift of God is our salvation or is the faith itself? Because I've well, had this question before. Uh -oh. Is it uh, referring well, to salvation or is it referring well, faith to faith is our the word of God. So it's not our faith anyway. Uh, it's God's faith. I mean, faith is a Bible. So uh, when we say we have faith, it's because we're, we believe the Bible. So it's not a personal faith that God gives us. Uh, it's, it's, it's eternal salvation itself. We, uh, there's a hymn I'm sure you're familiar with it as well with my soul. I love it. That hymn is. Uh, when I die, that's what I want to be sung at the funeral. Mm -hmm. um, the last verse says, uh, when the faith shall be sight. It doesn't say when my faith, but it says when the faith. Now, I know it's not the Bible, but uh, uh, it's like David says in Psalm 51, restoring to me the joy of thy salvation. Thy salvation. Mm -hmm. Understanding that it's not, it's not mine. In fact, it's mine just because, you know, nothing wrong with referring to my salvation, but uh, David was getting to the point of that it's my salvation because it's, it's thy salvation. So faith is uh, what God said. And then us believing that, uh, then we have faith. No? Not quite? Of course, you know, the Pharisees are very bad about that. As sometimes... Uh, People today call themselves Christians are very bad about uh, trying to uh, be the one, uh, well, what am I going to say here, the, the authority. Uh, when man is not the authority, God is. And man's standards are not necessarily God's standards. I was told that we don't have uh, from, uh, some other religious people if you want to call them that we don't have a uh, free will the only free will we have is the will to sin we don't have free will God has chosen us from the very beginning and um, he he has because God has the power to choose whoever he wants and he has chosen us from the very beginning before the foundation of the world and he chose that group, and that group he just didn't want to. And yeah. apparently, we don't have any will, any any so, free will at all. The only will we have is to sin. That's so we're serving God by force, practically. And that's not biblical. <laughs> and obviously, <laughs> and, and, but if we have the free will to, to sin, then that's choice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so then we do have choice. You know, we're choice and will is the same, same right. thing. So yeah, but see. Any man-made doctrine will always contradict itself. Uh, so yes, we do have options. Uh, I mean, if I go out and rob a bank, and I, if I don't have a will, then I can't be held responsible. God can't be held responsible for that if he made me do it. And if I do it, then he's the author of sin. So and well, that's not the The argument was that since God has is 99.999%, you know, the author for our salvation, then if we have that free will, that point one 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 percent whatever that is, percent, then we can still boast that, well, I said yes in the end. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I had to change the subject, let's put it that way. Well, no, I mean, you just, just making stuff up as they go along, and that's dangerous, you know. Uh, I mean, where did you get the 99% you know? Uh, that's not in the Bible. I mean, the reason I said yes is because I was convicted by the Holy Spirit to do so. Right. So yes, God does get credit for that. But blessed are they that mourn. We should mourn over sin. Should, sin should bother us. Uh, if you can watch some TV shows and it not bother you, then you've got a spiritual problem. 
there's been plenty of times I've turned on movies and something like that that had been recommended by people. And within just a few seconds of it, had to turn it off because of blaspheming God. And going back to the people and saying, you know that movie you recommended to me? Oh, that was horrible. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I mean, blaspheme God. And they say, well, I didn't notice that. Well, then you got a problem. <laughs> if it doesn't bother you, there's a problem. Of course, David's example of his own sin with Bathsheba. Unless you don't have the right attitude about being poor in spirit, you're not going to mourn correctly. Of your spiritual poverty. It should bother you that you don't know more than what you know. And so, to show that it bothers you means that there's action on your part to learn more. And a lot of people don't know the Bible and they don't care. They don't care. I, mean, I know one guy in our church years ago, somebody was talking about Bible college. He said, well, I got all the Bible I need in my heart. My new guy, he didn't have a very big Bible in there. <laughs> And then the last thing we'll look at is they shall be comforted. And then we're going to have a little bit of comfort. Those who mourn over their sin, does sin bother you? And remember, if sin doesn't bother you, it's still sin. Because sometimes sin won't bother you. But sometimes you might say something and not even realize that it's wrong. Or do something that may not realize it's wrong. Or feel something you may not realize it's wrong. Remember Paul in Romans chapter 7? He said, I had not known lust was a sin. Except the law said, thou shalt not covet. So feeling bad is not a prerequisite for repentance. If the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. Because I have heard many people say, well, until God convicts me of this, then I'm going to keep doing it. He's already given you evidence that it's wrong. Nobody will be talking to you about it. <laughs> All right. Take a break there.